So I went to the porn protest and I went on news night that night to talk about whether or not we should censor porn at all. And then um, in February, I ended up being invited to speak on a panel on whether porn empowers women <coughs> uh, at the Women of the World Festival. So I was being quite public and quite visible in my critiquing of the way in which this regulation had been brought through. Um, the other thing that I found a bit problematic about it was that none of this was an act of parliament. It wasn't debated by our elected representatives at any point. Um, the regulations themselves are a statutory instrument which is put together by civil servants in a back room basically without any democratic oversight and more and more laws are being brought through using these instruments which is another problem if you're interested in you know, democracy and uh, freedom of speech. So the month that I was uh, speaking at the Women of the World Festival in South Bank about whether porn can empower, I got a letter from the new UK porn regulator, which was called APOD, the Authority for Television on Demand, saying that they had become aware of my website through some means or other, <laughs> I wonder how, and that they were going to be investigating me to see whether I was in breach of the rules. None of the other spanking sites in the UK received a letter from them at that point, I was the only one. And I thought it was very interesting that they were claiming to try and make porn less harmful to society at the same time as targeting the only spanking site owner who was trying to produce porn in a consensual and ethical way that was actually more respectful towards queer bodies, female bodies, and not just repeating misogynistic tropes and being, you know, slightly dodgy in their working conditions on set. So I had to wonder at that point whether their stated aim of trying to make society less harmful and reduce the harms that porn had in society was actually what they had in mind or whether they were just trying to stifle freedom of speech and wanting to shut people up if they had anything to say about it. So I um, had all along intended to not do their work for them. When I found out the new reg regulations were coming in, I thought, well... Who knows how actively or how quickly it's going to be enforced. I don't want to contribute to a chilling effect by going through my content preemptively and trying to second guess what they might or might not object to. I'm just going to carry on doing what I'm doing and they can actually come and tell me what they want, if and when they want to. So at the point at which they started investigating the site, about 80 to 90% of it was arguably in breach of the regulations in as much as it, it depicted spanking that left marks on the body. So we're talking... Not blood, because that's already impossible to get past visas regulations, so already as porn producers complying with um, international credit card regulations about what you can and can't publish, which again have absolutely no legal oversight, I mean that's a whole separate issue. But now, as well as the visa regulations, we also have this rule that you can't show cane welts or any kind of bruises or really any kind of visible mark left by lovely implements that I like a lot, like riding props and leather belts. Um, so they had a good look around my site, and I got to see what they were looking at, which was very interesting, because some of the videos were watched three times, and some of them were watched 40-something times. <laughs> <laughs> and you can just sort of imagine them going like, oh, I'm not sure about that one. I don't know if that one's in breach or not. I have to watch it again just to make sure. <laughs> Um, speaking of fan fiction, the video that was watched the most times on Dreams of Spanking by Atwood uh, was a male male scene in which a wizard kidnaps a werewolf and cages him to harness his magical power to use as a spell, right? There is absolutely no BDSM in the scene at all, apart from some like very hammy beast play done by a trans man with a big beard climbing around in like furry chaps. Oh. It's, it's fucking lovely. Like, it's really adorable, but I have no idea why they were so interested in it that they had to watch it 47 and <laughs> <laughs> Or exactly which of the AVMS guidelines they considered it to be potentially in breach of. I think someone in the office must just have thought it was quite lovely. That's <laughs> the only conclusion I can draw. Um, so eventually, uh, in August last year, they released their final verdict, which is that I had been in breach of the new laws. Um, not only in terms of the type of content that I had on the site, but also because I hadn't blocked absolutely every single explicit image or video file behind a credit card paywall. And therefore I was letting children access my porn, which meant that I was in breach of another one of their rules. Um, this was actually deliberate. I have always thought that um, 
transparency is very important and destigmatizing fetish play is also quite important. And I wanted not only my potential paying customers to see what they were getting, but also people who maybe didn't have the financial access to um, buy memberships. I mean, not everyone who's an over 18 adult has a credit card. Um, to be able to, you know, find out about what I was doing and maybe realise that they weren't alone if they shared my interests. So that was a fairly kind of intentional political act to make the site quite accessible. And that was one of the things that was p particularly kind of come down on heavily by um, Atbod, that you are not allowed to have anything that wouldn't go on YouTube um, on your site unless the user has already paid with a credit card, apparently. <laughs> yeah. Um, so along the way, um, I during my appeal, I had quite a lot of good legal advice from an organisation called Backlash, which Charlie and Jerry are also affiliated with, which provides free legal support for people who are affected by sexual freedom issues in the UK. And um, anticipating that I might need to lean rather heavily on Backlash's services, in January, after the porn protest, I decided to do a bit of a fundraiser for them, just so I'd kind of be in credit, <laughs> um, and came up with this idea of um, doing an Indiegogo campaign where I promised, rather foolishly, um, but also I feel fairly gamely, to take one hard stroke of a cane for every £10 donated. <laughs> um, uh, I, not being totally stupid, I kind of set a predetermined limit of 50 strokes, which I feel is like an amount that I can heal from within a reasonable amount of time. And so me and a pal uh, who also runs a BDSM site put this up, and within a few days, we both reached our maximum because um, the donations were flooding in. In the end, we uh, raised £3,386. Uh, so like, yeah, for backlash. So it's like 383 cane strokes, which I ended up having to recruit eight additional, additional submissives to help us take. So the whole project kind of exploded a little bit. It was great. We got loads of reach, loads of like attention on the issues. Each of the caning videos, because we filmed every, um, every caning, um, and none of them, no one was paid, it was all done on a volunteer basis just to sort of raise awareness. But before each of the canings, we had the person who'd volunteered talking about why this was important to them and why they wanted to be involved. Um, and then as a slightly stubborn act of resistance, we uh, published them all on the internet under Creative Commons 4.0 International with attribution so that AppBod couldn't stop their spread. <laughs> um, and that was quite satisfying. So those are all still up there if you'd like to watch them. Um, and interestingly, when AppBod were investigating my site, one of those videos was one of the ones they picked on as being particularly naughty. So I like to know that at least they sat down and watched them and heard us talking about how dreadful they were. Uh, so sadly, in August, they ruled that um, I had been very naughty and they were going to refer me to Ofcom for a sanction. AppBod, by the way, who are the regulator, don't have any official government authority. They aren't a government department. They were seeded a few years ago by Ofcom, basically like a bailiff. They're kind of a private CEO. They had eight employees. Um, the guy who organized, who was the CEO was the guy who got permission from Ofcom to found the company who had previously been working for Ofcom. He was paying himself a salary of £130,000 a year plus benefits, all of that money being extorted from UK business owners who were publishing porn because the deal was that you either had to pay up a certain means-tested amount each year for the privilege of being censored. In my case, it would have been about six, seven hundred pounds for the amount that um, my business was taking. Or if you refused to, like I did, and then they ruled against you and Ofcom agreed and sanctioned you, then the sanction was something like five percent of your annual turnover, so about ten times as much as you would have been paying. So all of those fees and fines, I mean, under any other circumstance, that would be called a protection racket, I think were going to line the pockets of the guy whose idea this company had been in the first place. So the whole thing was a little bit suspect from beginning to end. Um, but the outcome of the way it was structured was that Outboard themselves couldn't punish me. They didn't have any actual ability to impose any sort of criminal justice sanctions on me. So all they could do is refer me back to the Office of Communications, Ofcom, to see what Ofcom thought should happen to me. Um, and at that point, with Backlash's help, I appealed to Ofcom under various arguments. Um, which I won't bore you with, but basically hinging on the fact that the way the regulations were brought in wasn't legally legitimate. So that appeal is underway. The same day I filed the appeal, I had to take my site offline. I had six months worth of content that I'd already shot and paid for, representing a significant investment of thousands of pounds, which I now couldn't edit and couldn't publish. That is still sitting on my hard drive gathering dust. 
I had spent five years of my life working 70 hour weeks to actualize this project which was as much an act of self-expression as it was a commercial enterprise. Um, I had invested thousands of pounds of my own money. It was as if I had built a house perfectly designed to suit my exact needs, beautifully interiorly decorated to make me feel exactly at home. And just as I'd paid off all of my loans and had started living in it, the government had told me they were bulldozing it. Like that is pretty much how it felt. With an added kick in the teeth that I was still the only spanking site that had been contacted by Outboard. And I had a very strong suspicion that, if I, suspicion that if I just kept my head down and not criticised the new regulations on the grounds of being kink-phobic, queer-phobic and sexist, uh, as well as a massive, massive threat to freedom of expression, that I would have been left well alone. And it did not escape my notice that the site's producing fairly typical male doms, banks, female sub for being a naughty girl or for being a wife overspending on her credit card, they are all completely untouched. Whereas my site, which had trans bodies, queer bodies, fat bodies, people of colour, um, male-male interactions, and a lot of things that maybe challenged the status quo, was the one that was being picked on. So since then, um, the update to the situation is not for me personally. My appeal is going to be pending for a long time to come. It's been six months already. And um, there have been two prior <coughs> successful appeals to Ofcom, where Ofcom accepted, yeah, you shouldn't have been censored, carry on which is good, and a couple more where Ofcom made the opposite decision, but in each of those cases it's taken a year at least. So I'm not expecting to hear anything back about the result of my personal appeal for another six months, and in the meantime I just have to sit on my hands and not publish anything. <coughs> but meanwhile, um, a month ago, uh, well at the start of January 2016, Ofcom announced that Atvod, this private company run by a guy with a particular uh, beams bonnet about female domination, and the one who's paying himself such a high salary, was such a PR failure that they've decided that Outbod is going to no longer have responsibility for um, enforcing the OBMS regulations. So Outbod has been folded, and Ofcom themselves are now going to be taking over regulatory responsibility. So in terms of what that means, I can't really pu um, speculate publicly. Uh, we're going to have to see how it plays out. Um, but I am pleased to report that Pete Johnson, the CEO of Outbot, has not been rehired by Ofcom. He is a disgrace. <laughs> so hopefully, at the very least, his particular weird vendetta against male-male content and female domination will not be perpetuated by Ofcom. And um, now that the regulation is being undertaken by a natural government, government department, we maybe might optimistically hope that it will be done in a slightly more official way, but it remains to be seen. So that's about uh, the impact it's had on me. I have to say 2015 was a bit of a shit year, but uh, you know, I'm keeping on keeping on. And um, it's very hard not to contextualize this, both in the wider structure of criminalization of consensual sex work um, and the ways in which sex workers are criminalized for trying to make a living on their own terms. And, but also within increasing um, threats to our digital liberties and our online rights. Um, there have been repeated attempts to control and regulate and censor the internet ever since you know, it, it started to exist. I don't think any of them will ever be successful, but the ways in which they're trying to do it are becoming more and more intimidating and slightly scarier. So I think it's important to keep on challenging it where we see it and hang on to the amazing resource that the internet has given us to express ourselves and enjoy grassroots publishing without any control by large corporations or government agencies. So I think that's worth hanging on to, hanging on to if we can. Mm. So, my name is Charlotte Rose. Um, I don't do uh, um, porn videos, I don't make videos, um, I'm, I'm not a porn producer or star in that side of it. I am a sex worker. Um, when I first heard of it, it was probably the end, middle of November, and um, it was a, a woman on Twitter that said, look, this is what's coming up, what can we do about it? And I had already ran for Parliament twice. So I, I ran uh, MP for Rochester and Stroud and Clacton on Sea against UKIP, <laughs> which that is a, a story in itself. Um, and it was all about sexual freedom. Now, um, 
I won Sex Worker of the Year 2013 with the Erotic Awards, and so I'd already worked with Tuppy Owens. Now, I don't know if you guys are aware of Tuppy Owens, but she works with people with sex and disabilities, and she's got the website, the TLC Trust, uh, which, which is in collaboration with the Outsiders uh, uh, charity that helps people with disabilities find love, which is fantastic. And um, that's where the, the, that came off the Erotic Awards where they raised money for those charities. And this is what she got in touch with me because I was taking over the Sexual Freedom Awards, which used to be the Erotic Awards. And she said that there's been a by-election and it's one of the, the first of its kind in 30 years. Would you want to stand? And I said, well, to be honest, I don't really know much about politics. And to be honest, I still don't know much about politics. It's, it's you know, every, every year politics just grows more and more fabrications of the way they see that we should be rather than letting us be who we are. And this is something that I felt really, really strongly towards. And I thought, yeah, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fight for this. I'm going to stand up and defend something that means a lot to me but also other persons, you know, own personal liberties. These are being attacked. And, you know, what, what happened with the porn laws is, is that this got, this, this was made by unelected MPs making an amendment to an existing law without knowledge, without your consent. You didn't even have the right to challenge it. It was done without, without anything to do with you. And this is not the way that our, our world is supposed to be. You know, we're supposed to be in a day of democracy where our, our rights, our values, what we stand for, mean something. And this is where, when I stood for the, for, for the by-elections, I realised we don't really have a democracy. And, and, and I'll come back to that in, uh, shortly. But this person on Twitter said, we need somebody to stand up and, and, and talk about this and challenge this. And a friend of mine said, oh, yeah, you want Charlotte Rose? She's got a mouth on her. I thought, yeah, you know, <laughs> come on, I'll give it a go. And the, 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 the interest and the support, the online support that I got was just absolutely incredible. It really did. It, it stirred me on. It, it, it geared me up to just keep going and keep going. And, and the day of the event, the, the, the <coughs> protest itself, you know, the, the, the media the interest that it got for, the, for that was absolutely incredible. And yes, there was a larger uh, uh, ratio of uh, media there than, than participants, but that's not the point. The point was of what we could achieve if we stood together and believed in something that we can fight for, unified. And this is the thing that, you know, what happened that day is not about the porn side of it. It's and you know, Jerry will, will, will really go into that when he speaks next, is that your personal liberties are being taken away, they're being stripped from you without your consent. And the more awareness that we raise on these matters, the more we can stand and fight together and grow and unify our, 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 our voices and our forces to make, to make a difference. So that day, I mean, I know you, Pandora did loads of interviews that day, so did Jerry, so did I. I think I did about 58 interviews that day. But do you know what the great thing about that was? Is that people will look at it and say, well, why did you do it like that? You kind of glamorize that aspect of it with doing a whole, you know, an activity of face sitting. But do you know why that worked? It was because it, people were like, what? Somebody's face sitting somebody outside Parliament? I tell you what, you should have seen the amount of curtains that was twitching in that building that day. I bet you they were all looking and going, I wish I was there. This is boring in here. But it's these activities that, that we need to do to raise awareness. These crazy things that we need to do to make people, what, what was that, turn their heads? How many people have been walking down the corridors and saw porn, porn, what? There's a speech on porn, what, what? It's those sort of things that, that makes a difference, that, that gets people's attention. The media's portrayal of, of the things that we do as sex world workers, adult performers, has always stereotyped us into something seedy, something dirty. I'll give you an example. When I finished the, the political aspect, I, 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 asked, I got invited to join another political party. And um, one of the late, they said, we'd love you to have you on board. There's just a few questions. I was like, what's the questions about porn? Right, okay, well, um, do you want to give me a little bit more about what this question could be? It's about children and porn. I was like, right, 
okay, this is this is this will be interesting. So I got there, and you wouldn't believe the questions that they were asking me. They were absolutely ludicrous and ridiculous questions, like if my if my son goes on my mobile phone, he can access any type of pornography he wants. What do you do about that? I said, well, that's not pornography's responsibility. That's yours as a parent to take responsibility. And it's these ludicrous questions that the media has created about sex and the industry that we need to, we, we, we need to put them, nip it in the bud and put them in their place and say, no, it's not like that. You know, these activities, these particular laws were always created in the sense of protection. But it's not about protection. They're not protecting anybody. They're really, really not. The fact is the porn industry, the adult industry, is one of the most self-regulated industries there are. We put barriers in place. We put uh, restricted materials online. We all do that. But it's not seen as though that we're not able to be able to regulate it ourselves. They have to come in and dictate what we can and can't do, what we can <coughs> and can't see, and what we can and can't create with their, without their permission. And this is what we need to change. So from, from one of the things, the great things that when I ran for, ran for uh, Parliament is I wouldn't, I wouldn't make a good MP. I really wouldn't. I'd probably be the ones that would be sat in the back with the judges that got fired for wanking off. In the, in, you know. But you look at it in the sense of, I've got to say this, I would rather, if I got in trouble in court, I'd rather have my, my judge have had a wank that day than rather not. Can you imagine how more relaxed he would have been? <laughs> you know? So, but anyway. But when I was speaking to the public, the, thing, the three main areas that I stood for was better sex and relationship education in schools. Uh, sexual equality for the elderly and disabled and the decriminalization of sex work and it's great to know that there are things in, in place that are pushing up I mean what's going on in Scotland at the moment is absolutely fantastic with Joan Urquhart she's she Scotland has got a fantastic opportunity to be able to lead by example with Europe I mean um, You've got Luca Stevenson from the Sex Workers Open University that even stated that they've got the way to lead, they, they can lead the way for all of Europe. And then we've got different things that's been going on in Leeds as well with legalizing certain areas. It's a double-edged sword, it always will be because of what it's portraying. It's, it's giving people an opportunity to work in those areas, but we need more support groups to be able to help people to come away from the industry if they want to. Not stereotyping the people, well, not marginalizing the people that, that enjoy what they do. When we, um, when we did the, the, the face sitting protest, we were lucky enough to get a meeting with Parliament, and that's where Jerry came along with me, and, and um, Jane Fay was also there. I've got to be honest, I don't really remember too much of the interview because I was suffering with uh, a stomach bug or something. I kept having to run back and forth to the bathroom, so, which is unfortunate, but I think it went well. <laughs> <laughs> I also was very lucky to have a meeting with um, Care2, Beth Granter from Care2, um, um, and had the meeting with Peter Johnson. And I was very, very lucky as well to be able to record that interview that we do have copies of that you're more than welcome to, to listen to if you want. It's just over an hour long. But the fact was that even he wasn't even aware of the, the grey areas of what Amphod had incorporated with these particular laws. You know, that this is only deemed R18 restricted material when it's, when it's available 24-7, clips on demand online. So I said, you know, well, if we took it 23-6, would that mean it's okay? <laughs> oh, no, I can't tell you what you should and shouldn't do, but is that how it works? So nobody actually really knew how the structure, what they tried to incorporate, actually, actually worked. One of the other things as well that I just want to, I want to talk about is that the face it in protest itself caused me a lot of issues. It caused me a lot of, a, a lot of damages. Um, I mean, I know that, that uh, Pandora's livelihood was stripped away from her because of those. I also suffered with the loss of all social media. Um, I, had, I, I had issues with uh, Inland Revenue coming after me. I had issues with um, the parliamentary officials coming after me for my identity. identity, identity. I lost my Facebook, I lost my uh, YouTube account. I also had social services, I've got two children, I had social services attacking me. And I think that the more noise that I was making, the more I was pissing people off. 
and the more people kept trying to attack me. I still go through issues to this day, and I still fight them uh, wholeheartedly and honestly, because I'm honest about what I do. I'm, I'm, I enjoy what I do. I don't claim to enjoy what I do. I fucking love what I do. And nobody has the right to take the things that I like and love the most away from me. I'm not harming anyone. It's consensual. So what's the problem? One of the things that we need to talk about is that Miles Jackman at the first speech, he, he hit the nail on the head. He said it was the canary in the coal mine. It was a way of, this is how they're incorporating and, and taking away your freedom of speech by using pornography to be able to get in there. Because as, as one thing that uh, Terry said, who sat behind you, is that the reason why they did this was because they knew that there, it would be the least amount of people that would defend it. And this is how wonderful it's been over this last 12 months, well, uh, 16 months, that the amount of people that's coming forward. So the first one, the amount of online support was just incredible. I think within, within I think about 10 days, it was up to about 1, 1 1.2 thousand people who had, was supporting it. This is the unfortunate thing, is that because of the nature of it, not everybody wants to be able to put their face on it. So this is why in the future, what we've got coming up is different events and different speeches and different rallies that people will be able to go to that's not necessarily open to the public as, 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 as these particular ones were. But it will be a safe, sp safe space for you guys to really come together and, and network and grow. It's all about raising awareness. The people that, that, that's in this room now, I hope that the information that you take from us today, you'll pass it on to somebody else. And then that person can then pass it on to somebody else. And we'll keep growing and we'll keep collecting and fighting together. Strong, strong and whole, that's what we need to do. We can't do it on our own, I can't do it on my own. And the years, that I've, the, the time that I've been here, it's been fantastic to be able to meet people like Pandora, meet people like Jerry, and other people in the industry that are bringing together, and Andy as well. You know, and this is what, this is what we need to do. You don't be shy to be able to be positive about something that you, that you like to do. We're not prudish. England is not a prudish place. We're one of the kinkiest countries <laughs> in the world. We are. But what you do behind closed doors is your choice. Nobody has the right to be able to come in and say, you can't do this, you can't view this, you can't see that, you can't do that, you can't say that, and you can't feel this. Because it's all about how you feel at the end of the day. If you feel strongly about supporting this, then please do join me. Join me, join Pandora, join Jerry, Sex and Censorship. You've got the ECP, the English Collective of Prostitutes. They work so hard to defend sex workers' rights also with the Sex Workers Open University. You know, they hold workshops that people can come to and network and learn skills and, and, and gain friends. You've also got backlash, is what Pandora said as well. And this is what we need to be doing. You know, would you like somebody to come into your bedroom and <coughs> censor what you can watch? You know, you're just about to enjoy a nice cheeky one before you go to sleep and somebody, a government, well not even a government man comes in and says, uh uh, you can't watch that. That's been that's been made and distributed in the UK. That's ludicrous. That's absolutely ludicrous. So if, if you if this is what something that you feel strongly about, then please do get on board, join us on Twitter, join me, join Terry, uh, join Jerry, join Pandora, join Jay, join Miles Mar Jackman. There's so many different areas that you can go to to really reach out and find out more information. One of the last things that I wanted to say in regards to, not necessarily the porn side, but the sex worker side, with what's been happening with uh, decriminalization, is we really, really do need to be supporting this as well. And it's understanding the differences between legalization, decriminalization, and criminalization. One of the things uh, in um, Northern Ireland, they've, they've gone backwards, unfortunately, now they've gone for the criminalization of sex work. So what that means is that it's perfectly okay for a sex worker to work, but you can't buy it from me. So, you know, not only does that discriminate clients and penalizes people with disabilities, but it takes the good quality clients away. And this can create dangers, it can create competition, it can, it can create uh, safety standards would drop, sexual standards would drop as well because people are trying to earn a living. So you look at it in the sense of, who's creating poverty here? Is it the government creating poverty? 
If the government are putting these particular practices in place, who's creating poverty? We're trying to earn a living, but we're told that we can't have any clients. That's crazy. That's absolutely crazy. So we need to be looking at not legalizing it. We don't really want to be legalizing it where the government's in control of what we do, like the red light districts in, in Leeds, for example. The unfortunate thing is, is only things like this get implemented when somebody dies, when, somebody, when something dangerous happens. Why should we not be looking at preventing rather than cure? This is what, why talks like this are so important. The information that you gain today needs to be shared with other people. All these empty seats, you should count up and think, right, if there's 20 empty seats here, how many people are here? We need to talk to two people each. And let's spread that word, let's spread that message. Because no matter what, it's all about safety at the end of the day. It's safety for the, for the person, it's safety for the client, it's safety for the user, it's safety for all of us. Providing we're safe and we're not harming anyone and it's consensual, nobody has the right to take your sexual freedom in whatever activities you do away from you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jerry Barnett. I wasn't speak, um, planned to, to speak today, but Charlotte invited me to, so I thought I would. Um, so thank you for the invitation, and Laura. Um, my background, um, I have about 20 years involvement with the online porn industry. My background is as a technologist, um, so I, I was uh, involved actually with internet technologies um, for about 25 years or so. Um, I got involved with the porn industry very early by accident really because it was the biggest thing, the biggest show in town <coughs> on the early internet and um, so I've kind of been involved with it in one way or another ever since. So originally I was a technologist, I set up, I, I, I charged people to build sites for them and one of the biggest mistakes I've ever made in my life, I, I pride myself that I've made many, which is you know, um, a sign of something, um, was the, the first porn site I ever built, I was offered a share in it, and I was told that, well, I, I, I told the client that porn wouldn't really sell because you could get it for free. This is back in 95, 96. So he paid me a nice sum of money to build it, and he became a millionaire by the end of the 1990s. But, you know, uh, that's life. <laughs> um, in 2004, I got my own site called Strictly Broadband. Uh, it was a very different kind of site to Pandora's. It was a very mainstream site, it was kind of a, a Netflix of porn in its day, um, so I didn't make any porn. I published five DVDs a day in streaming format, um, and they came right from across the board, so there's quite a lot of kink on there, but kink didn't really sell because it wasn't a kink site, and people go to more specialist places for kink. Um, we had gay content and, and trans content <coughs> and so on, but pr primarily it was fairly mainstream site where people could see fairly mainstream porn from a, a load of studios around the world. Um, <coughs> built in 2004, um, and I predicted that porn wasn't long for this world. I mean, I, I always thought that porn was going to eat itself in that it was only valuable because it was scarce, and as the internet developed and, and got better and faster, um, porn was going to be cheaper to access. I didn't realize how quickly it was going to become free. Um, across the board, but you know, I, um, I, I got involved. I, I, I set up my site, launched in 2004. It grew um, really well. It became the market leader in the UK um, within a year or so, um, and that was fun. So sort of running the UK's biggest porn site um, for a little bit, and then from 2007, um, the free sites appeared, the tube sites, I think YouPorn and, and, and the rest of them, and that really everyone peaked in 2007, everyone had a porn business, and then we all started declining um, and, and, and kind of struggling to, to find ways to sell porn. And as you know, I, I think nobody below a certain age has ever paid for porn. Everyone above a certain age has paid for porn, but you know, um, nobody pays, almost nobody pays for porn anymore, except where there's a real niche. So it's sites like um, Pandora's and so on that have stayed around. It's not tiny though. <laughs> <laughs> Stay tiny, but, <laughs> but, um, but it was fun. Um, I, so I got involved very early on with that part because I was a, a very high profile UK pornographer. There wasn't any chance of hiding like most, most people were, were doing. 
the pretending to be working for a Spanish company or, or whatever, which loads of, loads of, most of the British porn industry has never been officially British, you know, so um, I was kind of naive and, you know, and also very, quite political and thought that we should work legally in the UK. Most people never thought for a minute, people with more experience in the porn industry than me, never thought for a minute we would be tolerated and so they, they were kept a very low profile. Um, and so I first met the, the famous Mr. Pete Johnson that Pandora's mentioned in 2007 before he set up Adford. <coughs> he seemed like a very nice guy. He kind of talked me through the regulations he was planning. Um, kind of, you know, and so I, I started implementing them on the site. And when he set up Adford in 2010, um, the regulations he implemented had more bite than he had told me they were going to have and than, than anyone expected. And in particular, there was this rule saying that you, you couldn't allow anyone into the site until you verified their age. That sounds really reasonable and, and child protection and everything, but in practice you can't do it. Try finding out how old a person is before you let them into your site. It's, it's, you can do it, and it's very, very expensive, and it, it's not possible to run a viable business um, and do that. <coughs> so I was chair by this point of the UK's Adult Trade Association, so I kept lobbying and talking to Atwood and trying to point out that these regulations were ludicrous and they weren't, they weren't going to create a regulated porn industry, they were going to wipe out the UK porn industry. Um, and I made a lot of noise and got a lot of attention and so it's not a surprise that I was one of the first sites they came after. So as Pandora found, um, making a noise is good for the soul but it's not necessarily good for business. Yeah. So, um, they came after me, it, you know, the mainstream sites were the first ones they closed down. They, they drove Playboy out to the UK fairly quickly. They moved to Canada. They had the resources to do it. Various other sites, and then my site was closed down in 2012. Um, and it was pretty much on its last legs anyway, because of the nature of the business. Um, after I closed, I closed down the site, I had about eight employees, got rid of them, closed down the business. and. Um, it came at a good point because I'd been working for a long time. It was time, time for a break. My partner was pregnant. It was, it was an opportunity for me to be a stay-at-home dad and nice things like that. So actually, I can thank Hapwood for, uh, for a lifestyle, helping me make a lifestyle choice. Um, and uh, long after, a month after I closed my business down, um, Ofcom whacked a fine on it of £60,000. Um, which was completely pointless because it was a limited company, you know, the company had no money to pay, they knew this. But they did it because I was the first high profile victim and they wanted to scare the crap out of the porn industry. So in December 2012 there were a, a load of stories around about me being a, a reckless threat to children and things like that, which wasn't a lot of fun, but uh, not, nobody noticed particularly. Um, so, you know, that. We were the first wave, they kind of wiped out everyone, every kind of mainstream porn business in the UK, and there weren't many, there were maybe half a dozen of us that had any profile, all wiped out. Um, and then they came, the next, for Apple, they, they could only go after businesses that were managed from the UK, and it's actually very hard to prove if a business is managed from the UK. So one of the reasons they then went after sex workers, uh, Dominic Caesar in particular, because they, they knew they were working as sex workers and they were running porn sites. So they could then say, they had proof they were running, um, they, they were operating porn sites from the UK. And I think in 2013, they, 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 went after, they went after something like 80, 90 websites, of which at least three quarters were run by dominatrices. And this, is, this wasn't the government porn regulator. They're supposed to be spending their time regulating things like BBC iPlayer, Channel 4 on demand, that was what they were actually set up to do. What they spent their entire time doing was closing down porn sites, and especially dominatrix porn sites. Um, and Pete Johnson was, I mean, you know, I got to know him very well, he's a very odd character. I'm on camera. Um, <laughs> um, a strange guy, and undoubtedly had a bee in his bonnet about porn. He somehow got himself to this position of power with the government mandate to be a state censor, which was quite weird, it had a very Nazi feel to the whole whole thing. Um, I set up in 2013, I set up the Sex and Censorship Campaign um, because um, it's the intersection of two things that became really important to me, sexual freedom on the one hand and free speech and I guess porn falls neatly in the middle of those. Um, 
as time as campaigning has gone on, I've found it um, more and more important to defend free speech in general, and porn to me is a special case of that. Um, you know, um, there are when you say when, when people attack free speech, everyone says, "Oh, that's bad." You know, that's you know that means I can't criticise the government or anything, and that's why they don't attack free speech. They they, they typically <coughs> the two attacks. One is protecting children from pornography, the other is protecting us all from terrorism. And so actually porn and terrorism, if you look at the news over the last few years, the way they've worked us up into a panic, there's been this kind of, you know, this, this kind of double act where, you know, they, they, they go on the porn for a few months and then when everyone's bored of that, then it's all terrorism and if there's a terrorist attack, then it's terrorism for a while and they have to they have to block WhatsApp because it, they can't monitor it, and you know, and they have to block. They have to have the power to block sites because terrorists might be using websites and things. Um, and so, you know, and that's what's been developing. So I, I became um, concerned far, far beyond pornography and to you know what this was really about. Um, in 2014, um, as Pandora said. Um, the upload regulations, which had actually already been in place, but they were made law in December 2014. So rather than just getting a fine for breaking them, you are now you, you are now breaking the law. Um, and the you know Charlotte did a fantastic job raising you know the face it in protest was a you know a masterstroke because it, it got the global media interested. But what had actually happened, and what a lot of people haven't noticed, is that technically from December last year, just over a year ago, well over 99.9% .9 of all the porn sites in the world are illegal in the UK. Now, that hasn't affected anyone because we all still look at Pornhub and everything else and, and nothing, nobody stopped us doing it, but we should wonder why that's happened. Why, you know, why pass a law that's made virtually all the porn in the world illegal and let us still access it? And of course, you know, the obvious, um, conclusion is they're not going to let us still access it. They now have a an argument, at least to convince MPs who don't know what the hell is going on, that they have to bring in a, 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 a site blocking regime, a state censor. And what I think is happening now is that Ofcom is lobbying government to become the state censor of the internet. And that we've Britain would then become the first democratic country to introduce full blown internet censorship and we would have done it under the excuse of protecting children from porn. So, possibly this year in the Queen's speech, um, there's actually a bill going through Parliament at the moment to do exactly this, but it's a private member's bill, and it probably won't succeed. But possibly in the Queen's speech, if you hear the words um, online child protection, then you might be seeing the end of the free internet in the UK. So, you know, this is a very, you know, basically will be going the way China, Iran, Saudi Arabia have gone. And, um, and it will be done under the, the auspices of protecting children from porn. <coughs> um, so yeah, I, that's a, a kind of overview of where we're at. So um, I run the Sex and Censorship Campaign, which is a <coughs> blog, and where I can I get, I make a noise in the media, and just try and um, point out, you, you know, there's no political opposition in this country. Whenever the Tories do something anti-porn, the Labour Party say, well, that's all very well, but it's too little, too late. And when Labour do something anti porn the Tories say it's too little, too late. The Lib Dems were uh, pretty good on free speech. I know they're not the most loved party in universities, especially. Um, but, um, them being wiped out at the last election is actually quite worrying, because it means there's no real free speech block in Parliament at all. You know, free speech is a hobby for half a dozen MPs who meet for lunch occasionally, you know, it's, and it needs to become something more important than that. Um, so yeah, before I go, I'll quickly plug. Um, I have a, a book coming out that I've been working on the last couple of years in between changing that piece and campaigning. Um, so uh, my book's called Porn Panic. It should be out in a couple of months. And um, please come to the, the blog, sexandcensorship.org. Um, join the mailing list and, and read the articles. Thank you. Chess in the middle, yeah, yeah, and then you can do the questions. Uh, so I was going to say, what is the specific block that you're having with moving or overseas? Um, like, why? 
make a call in UK if they're making it so difficult, I guess. Like, so um, the advice I was given by Backlash when I asked them about this was that it's not where your site is hosted that matters, it's where you personally, the person who has editorial control is based. And if you're running a big company and there's lots of people involved, that's easy to obfuscate, but if you're a one-person website making porn with which you yourself are in, it's kind of harder to create ambiguity about where in fact you're based. And um, the advice I was given was that if I tried to, say, register a business address in Spain and claim that I was operating from there, they wouldn't only look at where the business was hosted and operating from officially, they'd also look at where the video editing took place, where business decisions were made, where the files were uploaded from, and that basically it would be quite hard to actually get away with that once I was looked into. So I do know some producers who have got away with that, but the moment the spotlight fell on them, it would probably prove to be paper thin, and because I was already making a nuisance of myself, I decided it was a little bit too late for that. <laughs> so basically, these regulations are specifically punishing independent artists and people who are perhaps uh, more vulnerable to things like this rather than the big companies that they're claiming. Well, they got Playboy quite suspectfully, didn't they? And you? Yeah, I mean, Playboy had an infrastructure where they... But they could move to Canada, is my point. Yeah, but they let, I mean, in the process, they sacked about 20 staff here, so, you know, the regulator was, was losing... But I mean, the they're not actually protecting anybody. Is, is my, the kind of, my yeah. point is that rather than protecting anybody, which is what they're claiming to do, all they're doing is... Specific harming the, the UK economy. I mean, mm -hmm. most of my members were American, so I was actually importing cash into the UK economy, which, you know, it seems a bit of a weird thing to stop someone doing. Creating poverty. Right. <laughs> so, then, on top of that, do you think then the next place they'll go for is, like, there's websites like My Three Cams and Extra Lunch Money and stuff where people can, like, sell clips that they've made, which has, like, specific niches, and also live streaming things that are specific. Do you think that's the next thing, or how do you think they tell If you go onto adult work and you look, they've changed the regulations for certain activities for uploads on clips online. They've already done that. So, you know, their regulator would view it and then they'll say that it, it, it's not suitable. So they have, they're adhering to UK laws despite not even being in the UK. And our colleague, Megara Fury, who runs uh, Dominatrix Clips for Sale, was one of the people who was investigated concurrently with me, and her site was closed down at the same time mine was. She didn't even have a member's site, she was just on Clips for Sale. So, yeah, they're definitely... I mean, in terms of extra lunch money, the, um, at, the attitude is that uh, the clip site doesn't have editorial control of your mm -hmm. content. You, the person uploading it, has editorial control. So, say, I made the... I made the content and I sent it to someone outside of the country and they edited it and put it on Clips for Sale, that would be illegal or...? That's what Peter Johnson told me, that's what I have, I've got an, an audio copy of him stating that. That that would be okay? That that would be okay. And I don't think they're going to be as crazy as Johnson for in the future, but when I went in he would say things like, you know, if, if you said I'd go to Spain half the year and I edit my content over there, he'd say, okay, let's see your... your um, flight tickets for the last year, let's see emails showing that you're doing this. So, you know, you couldn't create a fake structure, you had to create all of the frills around it, which is quite hard. Mm. Yeah. I mean, in terms of that level of, you know, extra work to try and create a base overseas and have a business partner that you trust with your content, um, if I lose my appeal, that's certainly something I would consider. But um, while my appeal is being considered, there's not much point in me kind of you know, jeopardising the process by doing this, like, I'm still holding out for a win. So, yeah, I mean, and certainly if you're not sticking your head above the parapet and going on, you know, the news talking about how ridiculous it all is, then you can probably get away with having an overseas base without necessarily having to put too much work into it. Yeah, yeah. The disappointing thing is that a lot of the um, BDSM sites, which I've worked for as a performer and which I would now recommend to new performers, because I get a lot of emails from people saying, I'd like to get into porn as a performer, who are the good people to work for? Um, pretty much everyone that I would have recommended has been moved out of the UK. Like I've been closed down and the other two favourite sites that I promoted a lot have both moved to America. So um, if you're like now an adult industry worker, the options for a good experience on set have been drastically limited. Mm. Do you think that conditions then for porn actors in the UK are just going to get increasingly worse then? Because of this. I mean, I know that pe the rates have changed, you know, I, quite a while ago it used to be quite worthwhile being an actress or an actor, and I know that the rates have changed, you know, they could get a, a, a substantial amount of money for a day's work, whereas now... The rates are awful. I got offered £150 for a full day boy-girl shoot. Oh, for a full day? day. Yeah. Mm. Oh! <laughs> yeah. Jesus. And a lot of um, adult workers are now going to Berlin to do work. 
for European websites rather mm. than looking for work in the UK. I think that's a sign of the, the collapse of porn in general. I mean, globally, the industry is probably 5% the size it was 10 years ago. So just because that's because of the free content. So um, there aren't, I knew people earning a living full time doing porn and, you know, Terry uh, knows plenty. He's been around even longer than me, I think. So if you're a porn performer and you do escort and you get way more money than if you're doing porn. Yeah. Well, you've you got the balance. It's a loss leader as well. Like yeah. a it's a loss leader for your sex work. I mean, yeah. for me, my porn performance is pretty much a loss leader for my sex work rather than being, you know, an income in its own right. Mm -hmm. um, but the other thing that I was noticing, I mean, is that the direction that porn's been taking since, you know, the industry peaked globally, like since the tube sites have become more prevalent and there's just not as much money going in the industry anymore. Um, there's not much point trying to up a big multi-person company and expect to be able to maintain your overheads because the amount of overall sales you can get is pretty limited but there are more and more people um, creating like small one-person sites with really low overheads basically shooting their own stuff in their own bedrooms and webcamers producing clips and selling their own clips online they're basically doing DIY porn um, and they are entirely reliant on sites like extra lunch money and clips for sale and adult clips for tile and adult work mm. and so the fact that those sites are the ones being targeted is suppressing that kind of grassroots movement and that kind of increasing empowerment of people doing it themselves and shooting porn on their own terms rather than relying on big companies to hire them and pay rates so it kind of almost was a promising direction for the industry to be going in and now this changing legislation has kind of squashed it We've just got to watch out what's going to be coming up. I mean, it's one of the things that Jerry said in regards to the Queen's speech. You know, as soon as we've got more of an idea of what their idea is, then you can create further ideas on that. And it's 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 awful to know that we're kind of balancing on a double-edged sword of what where do we go, what do we do? But until that time comes, you know, we've we're all a little bit of headless chickens, aren't we? We do. Really? Oh, don't uh, in the UK? Don't we already have internet service providers? blocking certain yeah. websites. You do, things. but it's opt-in, and only 10% of people opted in. They're not opt-in, they're actually incorporating it already in. Yeah. Sky and BT are the first ones that did it at oh, the beginning yeah. of the year. You can mm. switch But you off. can switch yeah. them off. But the this my is point the thing. is that kind of like we're already having this uh, yeah. encroachment on things, um, you know, like much broader than just mm. sex work. Well, well yeah. they, these filters are damaging because, you know, you imagine that you're, that you're Part of your, you're just coming out of an LGBTQ community and you cannot access that information. So it's not just blocking porn sites, it's blocking educational sites at the same time. So, you know, who is to say that this information, this informative site is going to cause me any damage when, you know, who's, who's, who is responsible to be able to define who can see what and when, you know? And that's one of the biggest problems. This is a good thing that if you guys want to know more about that is, is to speak with Jane Fay. She, she's been working a lot with online filters and she is, you can follow her on Twitter and she's got loads of information on that if you need to. Cameron proposed that before the actual things like, I don't they know, but he's still going Yeah, for I remember it. that happening and it was quite unpopular at the time. Do you, so do you think that that's what they're trying to now move into now that they've got Apple behind them. The European Union said no to this mm. particular filter, but that's not stopped Cameron. He's still going for it, he's still pushing it through, and you know, the, the, uh, it, it's it's all swings and roundabouts with people. You know, there's a bit with this per with this company. There's a bit with this company, and you know, it, th this is where the problem the problem lies of who's doing what, when, how, and yeah. why. So I've heard that there's complaints that even people who opted out of having the filter they've yeah, already they've got it anyway. Really yeah. unreliable, but the yeah. filters are a, to me a sign of things to come. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in a way, they've already implemented all the technology for a blocking system. Mm -hmm. So if they do introduce a law this year or next year. They have the filters in place, they just yeah. need to flip them to permanent. Um, but if you look at what's blocked under the filters, other than the accidental stuff, and unfortunately the media focused on the stuff that was blocked by accident, and especially, you know, the gay press was really good at picking up on gay sites being blocked and stuff. But actually the stuff that was blocked deliberately is a lot scarier because things like drug information sites, um, mm -hmm. which the government doesn't give proper drug information, now you could, won't be able to get it off the internet. Self-harm sites, um, which is, um, they call them suicide sites and, and whatever, but you know, sites that offer support communities for help self harmers and, and things like that because because parents don't want their kids to access that kind of thing. Non sexual nudity, you know, and loads of, of I mean, there, there are just endless lists of, of things that fall under, into these filters. And you know, the big fear is, you know, if Ofcom 
do in and, and, and you know, it's and there's this kind of alliance of groups that want that are trying to lobby for censorship. So you know, Ofcom is doing it because it will become the state censor. Um, both senior Labour and Tory people are doing it. The entertainment industry is lobbying furiously for it because they can have pirate, pirated content blocked. So actually, there are, there are being leaked emails from Sony mm -hmm. um, saying, let's use children might look at porn to, to, to yeah. get blocking mm -hmm. interest. Because out of all of this, so you know, you, you go onto YouTube and you try and type in face sitting uh, activity and you won't fi find it other than the political stuff. If you type in somebody burning somebody alive in a cage, it's, it's all over it. Do you know, it's, this is one of the things that when I was campaigning originally for MP is to put better sex and relationship education at school because they're thinking it's on the aspect of protecting children. So surely you would think that the government would have the mentality of starting giving that information to children as they're growing to be able to give them the responsibility to them the ownership of understanding whether they want to or not. That's what you'd think that they would do. But the reason why they don't is not to do with porn, it's about control. This has all come at a very opportune time for the government because now they want to bring in the what? They're going to Parliament to discuss the Nordic model. Mm -hmm. And I feel this is all just like, like they're just honing in on sex workers now and it's like, well, you know, we've, we've banned the porn, now let's ban, let's ban sex work. I mean, one of the great things with that that's been going on is, again, I'm going to bring back to Scotland. Now, Joan, she wants, she wants to incorporate SUBS. Now, I don't know if people know what SUBS stand for, but it's small operating, uh, small owner um, operated brothels. This is to allow two to three sex workers to be able to work together for safety. And, and with Scotland being independent, again, I know I'm repeating myself, but this is a perfect opportunity for them to be able to lead by example. I mean, um, I, did a, I did a piece with, um, Oh, who was it? Um, the Daily Politics show on BBC about decriminalising brothels here in the UK. It's something. It's it's. I got a little bit of a backlash from that because it's not covering uh, decriminalisation as a whole, and I I understand <coughs> that. But for me, I look at the sense of I've, you've got to get your foot in the door with one thing to be able to incorporate more. And for when Scotland kicked up, when everything in Scotland happened, I thought this is absolutely fantastic. We really really need to support. Um, so when I went up to Scotland, I went up to Glasgow and I did a, a talk with the Scottish uh, Liberal Democrats up there. It was absolutely amazing just how many people are on board. But people aren't aware of it. You know, people still don't understand the differences between criminalising, legalising and decriminalising. And this is, this, this is where it's so important to be able to spread that message so people can think, well, actually, you're, you think that it's good by, 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 by legalising that, when actually that's not. And that's where... People have, have, have just got that misconstrued information online. So, you know, these soups will be an absolute, they'd be absolutely fantastic because people have always created the understanding of, of sex workers or uh, street workers to be, oh God, fishnet stockings, tits hanging out, got a baby in one hand and a heroin pipe in another hand, selling, selling themselves there ready. Jesus Christ, you're far from it. You really, really are. I mean, the percentages of sex workers that are oh, that way is very, very low. And rather than trying to wipe them out completely, it's not about that. It's supporting them. It's giving people support groups to be able to help them. More and options, not fewer. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> let's let's legalise you. You can work there between <clears throat> this time and that time so we know exactly what you're doing. We know exactly what's going on. When actually, you know, people think, oh, that's great. No, because if you're in a car and you still drive up to that area, you're still going to be done for curb crawling. Mm -hmm. Because it doesn't matter, it may, it may be okay for that worker to work there, but you approaching that area in a car, that, that's still a big problem. It's not eradicating the problem. It's, it's what we need to be doing is creating solutions to be able to put support groups in place to help sex workers. And that's the problem where the media come in and that's that's another way of stereotyping and marginalising us and, and you know, I mean the Soho raids, unbelievable. Yeah. Dragging out sex workers half naked into the street, handcuffing them, putting them down bare face down on the ground in their underwear, in front of the public, in front of the media, by police. Out of all the bodies in the world, in, in the UK. Sex workers. Yeah, to, to, to do that, where, where do we go for protection? 
And this is the great thing about that, um, you know, there are different models in place that, that we are trying to incorporate for sex workers to allow sex workers to be able to not be penalised by reporting a problem, but creating it as a hate crime so something can be done about it. But we're, we're so far behind, it's untrue. We've really, really got to be yeah. pushing forward with yeah. this. I tried to report to the police before, and they just told me that literally no one's going to care. And yeah. they just didn't even let me like make a statement. It was just, that yeah. was that. And I think the nature of the laws criminalising different aspects of sex work in the UK are a perfect example of the ways in which this isn't for anyone's protection. It's just mm -hmm. about control and mm -hmm. about controlling what women do with their bodies mm -hmm. and what anyone does sexually with their bodies. I, I think mean, it's also that people don't know what the laws are. Yeah. Including police. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, you will get police pe you will get police people arresting you. They have no right to do that and they can't name a law that they're arresting you under, they just know vaguely. They just feel like they should there's something mm -hmm. involved in it. For your exactly protection, because yeah, you're being trafficked. Exactly. You say that you're not, but you are. Yeah. You are. You're the victim. A perfect example of that is the is the media when you do stories. It's like I've done so many stories and, and they've said, so why do you do it? I love what I do, but you read the magazine or the paper that says, oh, she claims to like what she does because <laughs> so society can't, can't cope with the fact that she wants to do sex for a living. They can't cope the mentality of it. No, <laughs> not in England. And the people no, don't not, not my neighbouring street. Somebody who likes selling for sex? Oh, no. They but more importantly, even people who don't enjoy the work but need to do it because of economic constraints yeah. are more in need of legal protection. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Are like penalised even worse by being yeah. criminalised. So, like, exactly. decriminalisation would actually protect the people Everyone. who, yeah, are Everything most in need. Everything that these people are scared of would be helped with decriminalisation. Yeah. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. Definitely. You know, when they talk about trafficking, that would be helped by decriminalisation. Yeah. They're talking about protecting children. Again, this would be helped with decriminalisation. But it wouldn't make as much money. Trafficking is only, like... Five percent, even that of the whole sex industry it's in this country. Extreme, it's yeah, absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, it's yeah. like it's, it's, it's like. I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but in Scotland, Scotland actually has one more law that we don't. So if you're a sex worker and you have a child up to the age of 21 and they're living with you out and they're out of work, by you financially supporting them is, oh, yeah. is, is, is against the law because, because they're deemed as they're controlling you. That, that child, your child, your own child, you can be arrested for feeding your own child in Scotland. Ludicrous. <laughs> we Absolutely also, like, ludicrous. There was a teenager who was recently arrested for uh, being a trafficking victim. Oh. Uh, that is, they saw that she was with a man and they assumed she was underage. So they arrested him and they arrested her and put her in handcuffs and put her in a jail cell because they thought she was a, a victim of trafficking. Mm. This is the reality of what we're dealing with. And let's not forget the police really care for traffic so-called yeah. traffic victims that they never ever rape them or ask for like free sexual favors. Right? Yeah. 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 I feel yeah. like we're preaching to the choir here. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? Funny. Yeah. Or questions? <coughs> yes. A lot of things are surrounding the internet and media. So have you considered other practices to spread your message? I mean, I'll give you, Sex Expressions is a fantastic uh, um, example of that. So Sex Expressions, I don't know if people are aware of it, they're a collaborating group across uh, England, Scotland and Wales that are the next generation of sex educators that go out and they get lots of different people coming along for talks that so you had. Um, um, you, you've had uh, Emma Holton, for example, who was a victim of revenge porn. Um, she, she did a speech there um, when I went up to Newcastle. I'm speaking at Aberdeen on, on next Sunday. And they're absolutely fantastic. They're like 19 to 21 year olds and they are the next wave of sex educators <coughs> coming into schools. So by getting out there and doing talks, I know Pandora goes to universities to do, do, to do talks. I do a few talks, so do you. And the more talks that goes on, the more that that, that, that information then gets Hang on a minute, I need to find out more about this stuff. As I would say on my radio show, I'm going to Google the shit out of that. And then you find out as much information as you can, and then that's when you transfer it to somebody else. So there's loads of different ways. I mean, every time you go to something of any form of sex education, so now you've got that knowledge, you're able to contribute. You know, Sex Questions is a fantastic opportunity for doing that. But there's loads of different things that are coming up. You've got BISC, which is a sex educating program for people over the age of 13 year olds. So, you know, I mean, it would be brilliant if we could get something right in early on. I mean, you've got that lady, I can never pronounce her name, Giolash, Giolash, the Belgian lady. So the Belgian lady, she did a, um, I, I'll, I'll get you the details for it. 
Terry, can you remember what her name was? No, I can't. Well, well she's doing a show to Danish teacher. Yeah, well, she's uh, this Friday. She's doing a, a show called four, the right? Sex Box. So where people go in and have sex in a box, if you really fancy having sex in a box, and then they review it afterwards. But she did, <laughs> she did a show on um, I'm living in a box. You know that song, sorry. But so she did a, a show um, a couple of months back where she actually went into a school and she was delivering sex education to children in there. And some of the things that that, that, w that she came across and that she found was very, very worrying, considering, you know, she got a big board up of women's vaginas and that they asked the boys to pick out which one they particularly liked the most and all of them picked, like, a six-year-old girl's vagina with no, oh. with no hair. And they were cartoon. They were cartoon. They weren't, you know, actual photos. <laughs> They weren't. Yeah. But that's the way that the, the mentality side of, of, of things have gone and progressed because people aren't, kids aren't being taught today mm -hmm. right at an early age. I mean, it's like sexual assault, sexual abuse. Kids of today don't even know, aren't even aware that they've had that happen to them mm -hmm. until they're about 14, 15 years old when they, when they get taught about it in, in class. The main thing is, is listening to speakers about sex, about the industry, and extract, pulling out the information that we give you and seeing how you can use that information to benefit somebody else in the future. That's what it's all about. And as a little plug, we are doing a sex worker um, support society art show on Friday. Woo. So we're having, uh, we're having art, we're having we're doing live performance, uh, we've got some like audio visual magic happening. So you know, we're, we're, we're um, I know our society, I know that a lot of sex workers who are doing activism like this are interested in do, going beyond just essays and you know, like kind of invigorating like that kind of Diversity thing. Diversity of tactics. Which, I mean, so many essays. Exactly, and, and like when you look at things like the face looking protest, that is not only a protest, but it's also like, performance in that kind of a way so it's at hearts lane studio behind sainsbury's at 6 p.m on friday thank you <laughs> <laughs> any other questions uh, i was just wondering um if i could get a really concise difference between what you were saying with uh, decriminalization and legalization that i can take away decriminalization is the removal of all laws about sex work completely which means that any sex worker can do whatever they want without running into any legal instruments. Um, and legalisation is the creation of new laws which control what specific forms of sex work and what places and times are legal. Um, and normally, like for example, we've got some forms of legalisation in Europe. So legalisation has a tendency to give more powers to managers and bosses and um, less powers to workers, whereas decriminalisation um, takes makes workers have more power um, over, and like, yeah, especially to, um, sorry, got a bit tired, but especially in cases where managers and bosses are being too controlling, decriminalization gives the workers more power to resist or escape those situations. I mean, the best example of the harm of legalization is places like Holland, where um, the only legal brothels are state licensed brothels. There's only probably one per town. Um, they've stopped giving licenses for new state licensed brothels some time ago. So if you're a sex worker and you don't want to work at your local brothel or it's too far to commute, you can't start a new one. You have to work at that or nothing. And if your local brothel is dodgy, you have to work there anyway. Mm. And it's illegal to work alone or from your own house or with a mate. Like you have to go through these official channels and the um, possibility of corruption is much, much higher. Yeah, different types of legalisation in different countries, like what you said. I mean, mm. uh, Amsterdam itself, it's perfectly legal for you to have the window, but being independent, going backwards and forwards hotels is against the law. It's weird that so many people point to the uh, red light district windows as an yeah. example of like exploitation, well, where they're, they're the most empowered. Yeah. 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 Do you know, this is exactly the same as Soho. Like, really clamping down. Yeah. Yeah. This is the same as like, Soho, where people don't like, realise what they've done. And it's very, very clever. It's a very, very clever design financial influence infrastructure that they've incorporated and this is what they did in Soho. I'm not going to say who it was because I'm sure you all know who it was but over in Amsterdam exactly they've created a, a, an, an enlightenment empowered area that people can go to enjoy themselves. Rates of properties values then went up and then the, now the local councils are coming in squashing all those windows to be able to sell it off piece by piece to be able to uh, rise up rents 
and, and kill off uh, the, the local communities within that area. It's an absolute joke, and that's exactly what they're doing here in, in London as well. I'm not going to say who, but you know who. <laughs> the other um, harms of legalisation are some of the stuff that, like you were talking about earlier with getting harassed by social <coughs> services. I mean, um, in Germany, they're trying to bring in a law that uh, in order to be a legal sex worker, you have to carry your official sex worker ID on you at all times. Um, I don't think they're talking about armbands because that would be a bit obvious. But yeah. in, <laughs> some um, it like, could be one of those stakes that you light at. Yeah. Branding. Branding. I mean, in a lot of like African Stamp. countries, they've got forms of legalisation. In order to be a legal sex worker, you have to register with the police. Um, sometimes you get your name printed in the paper, mm -hmm. like your family will be notified, mm -hmm. you might have social services come around, you might have to go for mandatory health checks. And if you are someone who has a precarious migration status, then you're much more at risk of state violence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, in Germany as well, they were doing a thing where if you applied for disability and you had previously been registered as a sex worker, they would harass you to try and force you to do sex work again. I mean, this is one of the problems that they've done, is yeah. that, you know, when they've created ASBOs, so in certain areas where sex workers would work, they, they, would, they would automatically put ASBOs onto sex workers. This is one of the biggest problems, and this is what they've been doing. The they started off with the trial in Leeds, and they've said that the trial has been so successful that that's why they're carrying on doing it. So basically, rather than you going to the police and say, look, I've just had this event, something's happened to me, you would automatically get penalised because of what you're doing is illegal, and you'd be slapped on with an ASBO, and you try and get future work. With today's society, the way it goes of you know getting your criminal record checks, most employers are doing that now. That's it's going mandatory. Can you imagine ten years ago you you, you worked as a, uh, on the streets and you you had an ASBO for prostitution? Are you going to get work from that? You're not. So this is why you know again small support groups to prevent things like that needs to be be put in place.